where they were all told they were dying, but it was all a mistake. Hi, I'm Paul Bateman from the UK Scout Association. We're here visiting New York. Good morning, America. Good morning, everyone. I'm visiting New York, too. I'm Nancy Snyderman. And I'm Charles Gibson. It's uh, Wednesday, August 4th. No job is permanent. I guess I'm visiting, visiting, New, York. <laughs> oh. visiting New York as well. We'll extend you for a while. <laughs> well, into the week, maybe. <laughs> it's a man's world has long been a phrase that has made some feminist fume. But a new book takes a big swing at some feminist beliefs and says the concept of men having all the power is strictly a myth. We'll find out what led this author to challenge so many of the things that frankly, feminism is based on. And I can tell you, it's already started the conversations in this studio. We've already had a few <laughs> discussions this morning about all this. Also ahead, the sound of the 90s. What is it? Wow. This beeper doesn't kid around. I mean, it calls you at a distance of a couple of hundred <laughs> yards. But there is beeper madness around the country. You may be the last one on your block to carry one of these beepers. They say by the end of this year, close to 20 million beepers in service. We're going to explore why they're as popular with moms and maitre d's as they've been with doctors, doctors in the past. <laughs> also, the rising young star Anthony LaPaglia is going to be with us uh, right now in So I Married an Axe Murderer. But right now, Morton Dean has the news, and that is not an intro line to the news, Morton. You could have beat me, Charlie. <laughs> Thank you, and good morning, everyone. President Clinton is hearing from members of Congress today about what they heard from their constituents last night. The president told his TV audience last night that the country is in economic danger. He appealed for the American people to let Congress know the economic plan leads the way out of danger. I need, I need for you to tell the people's representatives to get on with the people's business. Tell them to change the direction of the economy and do it now so that we can start growing again, producing jobs again, and moving our country forward again. The House votes on the budget tomorrow, the Senate on Friday. The outcome is in doubt. In the Senate, the president needs the vote of at least one of the six Democrats who had opposed his program before. Arizona Senator Dennis DeConcini is considered the most likely to switch. From Japan. It's 38 after the hour. The first law of modern feminism is that men hold all, or at least the majority, of the power. But at least one man begs to differ. His name is Warren Farrell, and he's a psychologist who was elected three times to the board of the National Organization for Women in New York City. But in his new book, The Myth of Male Power, he takes to task many of the most cherished assumptions of groups like now, and he joins us this morning. It's a fascinating read. Thank that you. I will give you. <laughs> now, now. <laughs> to go over some of the details in this book, I, you know, obviously women talk about the glass ceiling. You mm -hmm. have made a big case for what you call the glass cellar. Yes, I'm saying that a lot of men feel, like for example, if a successful man meets a successful woman, oftentimes, and they have children, they're about, about, about ready to have children, the successful man, woman often says to herself, well, you know, I have three options here. Option one is I can be full-time involved with my children. Option two is I can be full-time involved with the workplace. Option three is I can do some combination of both. And the man says, well, you know, I have three options, too. Option one is I can work full-time. Option two is I can um, work full-time. And option three is I can um, work overtime. And so he, he often feels that when, when he commits and he has this opportunity for intimacy, that he's often encouraged to not be with the family and with love, but he's encouraged to turn his back on love and to be a wallet for the family. And so all you have to do is, is to go into a, car, a cab in New York City and ask a cab driver, what did you want to do when you were young? And he'll give you a fantasy of what he wanted to do when he was young. And, and ask him, what is he doing now? And he's driving a cab 60, 70 hours a week. But the reality week. is that women are really in low-paying jobs. Women who get divorced many times end up living below the poverty level. Mm -hmm. Women are left supporting children, and men many times don't do it. So people's myths or fantasies about what they want to become when they grow up fall on both sides of the sexual line. That's precisely what I'm saying that both sexes have disappointed fantasies. And what we've done for the last 25 years, and what I did when I was on the board of NOW in New York City, is I only, I only focused on women's experience of powerlessness. I did not understand men's experience of powerlessness. But how can you talk about women's a sense of powerlessness and equate it with men when there are only four women in the Senate? When, if you look at the number of CEOs in this country mm -hmm. who make more than $500,000 a year, you will rarely find a woman. All, there all aren't many women heading Fortune 500 companies. Mm -hmm. All of men's lives, we've learned to gather, to, to feel the obligation 
to earn the money in order to feel worthy of love. And so, yes, men earn more money, but when a person feels obligated to earn money, that's not options, and options is power, obligation is not power. So you can measure the powerlessness of a group of people by their feel the, the feelings that they have to feel obligated to earn more money. So for example, if I ask a woman out when I was a kid, I learned that I couldn't feel comfortable asking her out unless I had more money than she did in order to pay for her dinner, in order to pay for her ticket. So I began taking jobs that earned me more money that pay that, that I liked less. I took jobs like lawn mowing rather than babysitting. Let me move was, on to health care for a second. Okay. You make a case that prostate cancer kills as many men than as breast cancer kills women and yet funding for breast cancer far outstrips 600, funding. 660% more funding for breast cancer. But those stats really cancer. don't stand up. I mean there aren't more men dying of prostate no, cancer no. and they're very different diseases. They're, well, of course they're different diseases, but there are 14% fewer men dying of prostate cancer than there are women dying of breast cancer. And there are 660% more funding for breast cancer than there is for prostate cancer. Now what I'm saying is this, I'm saying is that I support strongly research for breast cancer and for women's health. But I also support strongly men learning that they are also dying of 17 areas of health that are extremely underfunded also to learn about testicular cancer, to learn about pr prostate cancer. And I'm, I'm challenging us as the government uh, for, to put our taxpayer money also into helping men live. Because when men die, women are also hurt. When either sex loses, when either sex wins, both sexes lose. Well, the book is called The Myth of Male Power is a controversial read. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think thank you. <laughs> coming up next, that beep, beep, beep sound heard throughout the land. The pages are coming when Good Morning America continues here on ABC. <laughs>